This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Hello. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome Sarah Hodling today. Sarah graduated from Harvard in 1999 and received her MFA from the University of Michigan. She's the recipient of a Fulbright Scholarship to Paris, first prize in the Avery and Jules Hopwood Awards, and a St John Steinbeck Fellowship. She currently lives in the Bay Area where she teaches high school English and is married to the writer Daniel Mason, a match I might add that I have at least partial responsibility <laughs> for. <clears throat> Pictures at an exhibition, yes, yeah, see? Pictures at an exhibition is a novel that Julia Glass calls an authoritative historical novel, a family saga, a labyrinthine love story, and a sumptuous meditation on the purpose and value of material beauty when war threatens the very fiber of civilization. In the novel, Max Berenson, the, no the son of a famous Jewish art dealer and his pianist wife, is forbidden from entering the family business for reasons he cannot understand. He reluctantly attends medical school, reserving his true passion for his father's beautiful and brilliant gallery assistant, Rose Clement. Is that right? Okay. When Paris falls to the Nazis, the Berensons survive in hiding. They return in 1944 to find that their priceless collection has vanished. Gone are the Matisses, the Picassos, and a singular Manet of mysterious importance. Madly driven to recover his father's paintings, Max navigates a torn city of corrupt art dealers, black marketers, resistants, and collaborators. The New York Times Book Review writes that, at one point, Max's father explains that he likes the Impressionists because they let your eye finish the picture. The same could be said of Hodling's elegant prose. Max's voice is at once crisp and poetic, detailed and spare. While the freelance star writes, haunting with amazing authenticity, the author tells her character's story with all the twists and turns of the very best fiction. Uh, one of the things that impressed me so much about this novel is Sarah's ability to seamlessly pack a library full of historical facts into a novel so graceful and fluid. In fact, when I was reading the reviews of the book for this intro, I was generally shocked, genuinely shocked to find so many reviews call the book histor a historical novel. It hadn't struck me that a novel so engaging and moving could be deemed historical fiction, a genre that I, at least, and perhaps wrongly, uh, think of as dense and heavy-handed a lot of the time. But it's Sarah's ability to create the world of pre- and post-war Paris with details as small as a description of a ch chandelier to the vivid paintings of Picasso and Monet, alongside the inner world of Max Berenson that makes this novel so effective. When we conceived of Story Hour, we wanted a place where both established and newer writers could share their work, and so we reserved one space a year for a first-time novelist. Sarah holds this place today, but I have no doubt that Pictures in the in, at the Exhibition is just the first of many novels, and hopefully this is just the first of many Story Hour readings. So, Sarah. Thank you so much, Melanie. I think that the last time Daniel read here, you were pregnant also, is that right? <laughs> so, <laughs> David, so good things come from uh, readings at store. Well, I better be careful. <laughs> um, but thank you so much to Melanie and Vikram and to David and to, to all the members of the library staff that are here and that, that have brought me here. Um, this is a community I love because it's filled with writers that I love and scholars that I love. My mother's PhD advisor is in the audience. My mother got her PhD in 1972. Um, and there's a picture, oh no, she got it in 77 because that was the year I was born. And so there's a picture of her in her cal, blue and gold with me in one hand and a cal diploma in the other. Um, so thank you all and thank you all for coming. Can you hear me okay, is the volumes okay? Um, so I thought that I would read two sections for you today. Um, they're kind of, they're both, I'll read two short sections from my novel um, and then um, I'll skip ahead to a new novel um, that's called The Great Silence um, and it's about the history of left-handed piano playing um, 
and I thought, and hopefully after I read the connection between uh, my first novel pictures at an exhibition and the new novel will become clear. I also was just, uh, I was just briefly in New York and I saw there that they have an exhibit at the MoMA, if any of you go to New York anytime soon, um, with artifacts from the art gallery of Paul Rosenberg, who's the French art dealer that my novel is based on. Um, and so it was tremendously moving to see um, all these letters that he'd written to Picasso and to Matisse in his own hand. Um, and so part of what I'll read today is also inspired by that. This is told from the point of view of Max Berenson. He's 19 right now, it's 1939. Father had been to visit Matisse in his Mediterranean sanctuary on Simiez Hill with its cages of doves, Moroccan tapestries, and views of the Roman ruins. Father loved the South in the winter without its hordes. He was childlike and gay after a few hours spent in the presence of his artists, and this was both infectious and infuriating to me. Tanned, sitting at our dinner table, he said, last time I chose one set of paintings, and when I had a leg over the threshold, the, the old Buddha said, wait, Daniel, those ones I've decided to keep. He's got a right to sell them on his own, of course. He suffers for them, says painting his delectable models and vases is more like slitting an abscess with a penknife or kicking down a door. Today, Henri told me he begins to paint when he, when he has the urge to strangle a man. I just nod. The paintings are so lovely. What a batty old Buddha. This time I chose all the ugly paintings, and he switched his dotty mind and would only give me these marvelous still lifes and pink nudes. You could squeeze the lemons on the canvas. They're so bright. We're lucky we live across from Pablo and not Henri. Um, the Rosenberg, the Berenson family, based on the Rosenbergs, shared an apartment complex with Picasso. Henri has fewer legal problems, mother said in her thick Polish accent, only because he's too old to chase skirts. Now they, just, now they all just work for him, and divorce suits Picasso. Does it, mother asked. Her right hand played 16th notes against the tablecloth. Father had helped Picasso negotiate the separation from his ballerina wife. Before Rose, the thought that the world possessed a woman more beautiful than Olga Kolakova had been inconceivable. Picasso had worried that his beleaguered former bride would wrest half his paintings from him in the settlement. For three days, father had sat over Monsieur Picasso's bank books, unwilling to trust anyone else to the task, and the two men drew up long lists of his assets. Somehow, father had convinced Olga to part from Picasso without either money or art. Now that he has the Russian off his mind, he has five new paintings ready for me. I'll see them this afternoon. I've been dreaming of these, painting my own Picassos in my mind. Father snatched up my mother's hand and kissed the curled fingers. Can you feel it? The current running through us. We've grasped the cord that ties Manet's generation of French painting to ours. Picasso isn't French, I said. He's French now, Father replied. As French as mother, I said, and she laughed. And so what happens after this is that Max's father, because he's so overjoyed at Picasso's new paintings, um, gives Max a single chance to go to an art auction and buy a painting. He gives him 10,000 francs, which was about the cost of a new automobile at that time. And Max goes to Drouot's auction house. Um, and this was one of the really fun things about writing this novel, was going to an auction and trying to imagine that I was a young, confused man, 19 years old, 50 years before, 60 years before. Um, and he goes to an auction house and he buys um, a Manet. And when he comes home, his father takes one look at it and says, you've bought a fake. And he's bereft. And then this is a scene that happens shortly there afterwards. The next day, I listened to the radio with mother. A Russian diplomat ex explained the importance of Finnish territorial concessions lest the Germans invade the Hanko Peninsula or use Karelia or Lapland as the bridgehead from which to attack Leningrad. It seemed to me that they were talking about Mars. Mother turned off the radio and played a few bars of music. When I hear Finland, I think of Sibelius, she said. My teacher heard Sibelius give a lecture on the overtones one hears in a meadow. You hear those too, I said. The mother is a professional pianist. Not a meadow, mother said. At least not usually. We don't spend much time in meadows, yet. Mother repeated daily her desire to leave Paris. All cities, she thought, were at risk. She played a few more bars of music. 
Here's someone else, she said. Not Sibelius. But it sounds the same. It's not. She played one phrase, then another. That's Sibelius. She played more notes. And that's Musorsky, who came first. But I can't blame the Finn. She played some more. Finally, she said, one can hardly blame a copyist. I realized then what she was trying to say. This was her own oblique, nearly opaque forgiveness then for my transgression, for the fake. In my youth, it has come as a revelation to consider that some of my mother's strangeness was a result of her speaking to me in a language that wasn't her native tongue. With the crisis in Europe, though, as mother grew ever more unusual, I decided that she would have been perplexing in any language. Or rather, that language for her was a necessity, but not her preferred means of communication. Thus, during an explanation such as this, it was best to sit quietly. I hadn't the training to discuss Sibelius or Musorsky. At times, I wished I'd continued the music lessons of my childhood. As an adolescent, this same kind of wish had led me to study Polish, secretly, for a few months, in hopes that one day I would speak to my mother in a proud declarative sentence and she would answer me with joy and clarity. Sadly, perhaps because gifts of music and language are often linked, I possessed neither one. She was now playing a new piece. Pictures at an exhibition. Muzorski wrote this for the painter Victor Hartman, who died young, she said. They had an exhibition of his watercolors, and Musorsky went and composed a piece for each of the paintings, a composition that accompanied him throughout the exhibit. This, the promenade that I'm playing, means Musorsky was walking between paintings, movement one. And the first painting he saw was the gnome, and that's movement two. She played the promenade theme again. Listen to how dignified and precise the rhythm is. Then he sees another painting, I could hear the, a key change, and that's the old castle. This is the closest you can ever get to that exhibition. They say all of Hartman's paintings have been lost, so there's only the music, and Musorski drank himself to death. That same March, Mother developed a nervous cramp in her right hand that gripped her four fingers into a claw, leaving only the thumb mobile. It appeared spasmodically, and no doctor could treat or diagnose it. Her performing schedule was curtailed, no longer tied to the symphony season, she clamored for a move south. There was a known specialist in Nice and a hypnotist in Bordeaux. The humid climate might be good for her clenched muscles. Father delayed, and mother practiced Ravel's concerto for left hand. And so it's on this idea of a concerto for the left hand that I'll switch to my new novel. Um, I became interested in this idea of the history of left-handed piano music, um, and uh, there wasn't a place for it in this novel, and I was doing too much research about other things, but it stayed with me, and it kind of became the foundation of, of The Great Silence, which is novel part two. Um, and I should also add that a lot of the, the research that I did for this new novel has been done in the, in the Berkeley libraries, and that I'm tremendously grateful for the support that you guys have provided. And I know David and Beverly have heard this before, but one of the ways I knew Daniel was serious about me when we first started dating was that he loaned me his library card. <laughs> In the 19th century, everyone was right-handed, whether they liked it or not. Likewise, all piano music has been essentially music for the right hand. The melody, the trills, the singing and fast-moving line, all these belong to the beloved right. Thus, the history of left-handed piano music finds itself in dark terrain. Even the word for left, gauche in French, sinistra in Italian, implies something is amiss, if not terribly wrong. Nevertheless, often a pianist has found himself in the situation where the right hand couldn't be used. Robert Schumann, born in 1810, was determined to perfect his technical skills. He assigned himself to play his own toccata ten times daily and consecutively as part of his eight-hour routine of keyboard practice. The piece is seven breakneck minutes long and demands from the pianist a continuous rocking motion from both hands, punctuated only briefly by a sudden stretch of the fingers to play the percussive unison octaves. But the toccata did not improve Schumann's dexterity. Rather, it only exacerbated what the Saxon already knew. That his fourth finger on his right hand didn't move with the independence he had strived for, it remained the laziest of the five, meant only for wearing rings. 
So Schumann devised a machine made from a cigar box that restrained his middle and pointer fingers, stretching them into submission while he practiced drills for the other three. Schumann fitted the contraption, his cigarin mechanic, with screws and a vice, which not only stretched his fingers, but, some say, broke the middle one. Others say the mutilation was of another kind that Schumann attempted to operate on the tendons of his fourth and fifth finger himself, so as to free the fourth from its tendency to move with the little tyrant. All that's sure is that he ruined his hand, which forced him to turn from performance to composition. Schumann met Clara Wieck in Leipzig when he was 18 and she was nine, and they were married a dozen years later. Scholars call 1840, that year of their marriage, the leader yar, when Schumann in his exhilaration composed 168 songs, setting to music the poetry of Heine, Goethe, and Schiller. Yet the madness that led Schumann to wreck his own hand never stayed away for long. Twice he tried to take his life. Following the second attempt, where he leapt from a bridge into the Rhine, Schumann began to suffer from seizures and bizarre thoughts, including an abhorrence of all metal objects, such as house keys. A5, the second A above the musical staff, sounded continually in his ears. He asked Clara to commit him to an asylum, as he feared he might harm her, and there he died two years later. The source of his madness, whether it was syphilis, mercury poisoning, or bipolar mania, remains unknown. In 1877, 19 years after Robert's death, Clara, vacationing in Porshock, opened a drawer filled with plaster models of her husband's hand and injured her own. Johannes Brahms, as if he had known this, began that very day a transcription of Bach's Chacon for the left hand only. It arrived in Porshock two weeks later. He wrote, I don't suppose I've ever sent you anything as amusing as what I'm sending you today, provided your fingers can survive the pleasure. I wrote it for you. But don't overstrain your hand. It requires much resonance and strength. Play it for a while mezzo voce, if it doesn't exert you too much, which is what I'm afraid of. You ought to get great fun out of it. He had limited his chacon to five fingers, he explained, because Bach had had only the violin's four strings on which to compose his variations. Clara wrote in reply, Just think, wasn't it strange, on the day you've dated your chacon, the day after my arrival here, when I was opening a drawer, I indeed strained a muscle in my right hand, so you can imagine what a glorious refuge your chacon has been to me. What seems to be most extraordinary about it is the way in which you so faithfully reproduce the sound of a violin. It's true my fingers don't altogether master it, and my right hand itches to join in. The Brahms transcription demands much from the thumb. The fingers must be capable of leaping over it while the thumb does its work beneath. But beyond the technical challenges lay the darker significance of one hand playing alone. Is the Chacon Brahms's metaphor for Clara living without Robert? Or perhaps it's Brahms, performing and composing in solitude, yet thinking always of Clara, whom he loved with his soul, if not with his flesh. Ten years after Johannes Brahms first met Clara Schumann, Geza Zishi, a Hungarian count, age 14, was out hunting when his horse startled and his rifle fired at half cock, detaching his arm above the elbow. He was a young man of considerable fortune and an undaunted spirit. Upon the loss of this appendage, he developed a fascination with the piano, my piano mania, he called it, and pieces for the left hand alone. Zishi hired Franz Liszt as his teacher, and they became fast friends. The Count attended Liszt's master classes and lessons and could tease the maestro as no one else could, for example, on the subject of his pedagogical technique. If a young man played skillfully but without any indication of genius, Liszt dismissed him immediately. However, if the pianist were a young woman, and a pretty one at that, Liszt would listen to her for the better part of an hour, often resting his hand upon her hair or shoulder, murmuring, remarkable, remarkable. The male students were outraged at having to listen to inferior playing at such length and came to the general conclusion that Franz Liszt hardly listened to anyone play at all. Zishi confessed to Liszt a desire to compose for the left hand and with Liszt's encouragement wrote a great many pieces for it, 
most of which, though technically challenging, are quite dull. But the work did presage Zishi's concern for fellow amputees, a concern which soon reached tremendous proportions with the Great War. Soon, there were so many disabled amputees from the battles at Serre, Tannenberg, and the Marne that by 1915, it was possible for Zishi to perform a concert attended solely by men with one arm. Zishi's monograph, Das Buch des Einarmigen, went through five printings. This book of the one armed instructed his fellow amputees on how to peel an apple, shuck oysters, shave, knot a tie and tie shoes, and recommended everyday household items for use as levers and grips. But it was a would-be student of Franz Liszt's who composed the greatest number of pieces for the left hand. Leopold Godowski arrived in Weimar in 1886, planning to study with the great man, only to discover that Franz Liszt had died. A few years later, Godowski composed his symphonic metamorphoses on themes from the Gypsy Baron for the left hand only. Upon playing it, Bella Bartok wrote to his sister Elsa, then on holiday in Baden-Baden, I can barely get through it with two hands. It's not to be believed. Of Godowski's Chopin studies, 22 are for the left hand. Unlike Zishi, Godowski had full use of both his hands. Instead, he argued for the superiority of the left, claiming that the left hand maintained greater elasticity due to the practical and social protections of a right-handed milieu, and that the right three fingers on the left hand were better placed for playing melodies than the right three fingers on the right hand. Yet the stain of the sinistra haunts Godowski too. He developed these theories and his corpus of left-handed works in marathon spells of great endurance, working 15 hours at a time after a series of family losses in car accidents and suicides. It was one of Godowski's transcriptions of a Chopin etude that began the left-handed career of Paul Wittgenstein, scion of Austria's wealthiest family, brother of the Cambridge philosopher, they the only two boys to survive into old age in a family that had once numbered five sons and three daughters. In 1914, Wittgenstein donned the weaponry and uniform of second lieutenant in the sixth dragoons. The eight millimeter pistol, carbine rifle, saber in a steel scabbard, black plumed helmet, red cartridge belt and breeches, and pale blue coat. Wittgenstein and his fellow officers flashed brightly against the bare Polish forests as if exotic birds had been scattered in the snow as targets for the Russians' guns. The wound Wittgenstein sustained need not have cost him his arm. However, the shattered limb was amputated inexpertly and in haste. Indeed, in between the time when Paul was anesthetized and when he regained consciousness, the hospital in which the operation took place had been occupied by the Russian Fifth Army. The wounded men there were transferred on beers, on trains without heat or electricity to a prisoner of war camp in Siberia. There, in addition to tutoring his fellow inmates in French and Russian, Wittgenstein found an empty crate and marked it with charcoal to indicate the 36 black and 52 white keys on the piano's keyboard. For the duration of his imprisonment, Wittgenstein practiced piano with his left hand in this makeshift way working out the fingering for Godowski's arrangement of Chopin's revolutionary etude. Back in Vienna, and then later in exile on Long Island, Wittgenstein envisioned that he could save his piano career in two ways. First, he commissioned his era's great composers, Prokofiev, Hindemith, Britton, Strauss, and above all, Ravel, to write concerti for his left hand. And yes, they were for Wittgenstein's left hand alone for patronage included the stipulation that Wittgenstein be their sole performer. For a decade, in the case of Prokofiev and in the case of Ravel, until Wittgenstein's death. By 1951, Henry Tanner, aged 11, could hear Glenn Gould's recording of Bach's Goldberg variations a single time and replicate the first 12 movements without ever having seen the score. He also played it with a regular pace of three second breaks every 23 minutes, as this was how long it took the Thorin's record changer at WGBH to turn over the automatic sequence LPs. Tanner traveled to the USSR for the Moscow piano competition in 1958, where he delighted crowds and drew the attention of the CIA by speaking in Russian. 
by all accounts, until the attack that cost him his right hand, he appeared on the brink of great international fame, rivaling that of any other prodigy from Toronto, Leningrad, Languedoc, or Shreveport. These are all cases for the history books, and beyond the fact of being mere arcana would matter to few aside from the musicologist or the historian or the bureaucrat who thumbed the CIA files, unless the person in question was your brother and he was waiting for Paul Wittgenstein to die. Thank you very much. I'd love to take any questions you might have. Um, I love talking about the research project for, for both books or teaching high school. My favorite cafe in Berkeley. Yes, Melanie? Your favorite cafe. Oh, my favorite. Well, recently I've been going to the new, Miss, the one next to Mrs. Dalloway's. That's, it has good, there's good people watching. The windows are very big. So, okay. <laughs> So Melanie's question is about writing from the point of view of a young man, which I'm going to do in this new one too, somewhat to my chagrin. <laughs> um, and I'm not totally sure why I find myself doing that. I don't even have any brothers, um, but <laughs> I have three sisters. Um, I think it has something to do with the desire to distance your own voice from your character's voices. Um, and so, to, to kind of discover them in a way that is separate from your own sort of tiresome personal psychology or something like that. So, so the question is about the CIA pops up in there and where's that gonna take me? And I, there, I'm sure people here who I would need your uh, expertise on this esteemed bureaucratic institution. Um, where it's gonna take me is that when uh, Henry wins something called the Moscow Piano Competition, which is based on the Tchaikovsky Piano Competition in 1958, um, and because it's still the Cold War, he goes there, and he's there for three weeks. And at the end of this three weeks, he wins Khrushchev. The judges have to ask Khrushchev for permission whether or not they can give him first prize. And Khrushchev says, is he the best? And they say yes, and he says, we'll give him first prize. Um, and at the um, press conference, someone asks Henry a question that's kind of barbed, and they ask in, in Russian, obviously, and Henry responds in Russian. Um, even before it's been translated. So this American, the bashful Bostonian, becomes the Boston Bolshevik overnight. Um, and his brother realizes that he speaks Russian because he's been there for three weeks, um, because his brain didn't have anything else to memorize just because he can. Um, and so he gets, Henry gets involved in this kind of complicated nexus of the CIA interfering in the lives of artists, um, particularly trying to blackmail homosexuals um, to work for them because they're considered you know, easy targets for blackmail. Um, Nicholas Nabokov, um, the, he's the nephew of Vladimir, is that right? Or is he the cousin? I can't remember, he's somehow related to him. Um, works for an institution whose name I'm forgetting, but it's the sort of the, information, American information services, something that gave a lot of money to artists, but really what it was doing, it was actually an arm of the CIA giving money to artists to spy on other artists. Um, so I'm interested in that kind of creepy infiltration of artist circles by the CIA. So, great. Well, it's lovely to meet all of you. Thank you all for coming and have a great day.